It's a great honor to be here today to give this uh, keynote address. Um, and I particularly want to thank uh, Roman Katzman um, for uh, ha having organized such a wonderful conference, but also for the invitation. And uh, since I know some of his interests, I thought it was very obvious that I would speak on the uh, Bible, particularly uh, on the occasion of the new book. Um, my talk today is entitled Bible in Context, the Question of Cultural Identity. And I think I'm going to contradict Professor Morath and suggest that I'm not giving answers, I am perhaps ans asking more questions. And I think that's how it should be. Um, you see, um, I, I'm in the background some uh, different contexts of uh, Is That Bible's Life, and particularly um, the uh, uh, <clears throat> some very nice photos of Odessa and uh, Pinchas Minkowski's choir will appear eventually. Um, I, I've uh, got a very long lecture, I'm not going to read it all. Um, we'll see how we go for time. I'll, I'll read parts that I think are just aspects of this question of cultural identity, not only Bibles, but also the cultural identity of Jews like him who grew up in Tsarist Russia and came to prominence before the revolution and immediately after uh, the revolution and uh, wrote not in Yiddish or in Hebrew but in Russian, but did not, contrary to what people assume, what many scholars for many years assumed, never um, disassociated themselves or detached themselves from Hebrew. Of course, as you'll see later on in the lecture, there were other examples of writers who had very different attitudes. Um, so, first of all, one, the war of the Jews or the Jewish cultural wars. Dan Miron's prime example in arguing for contiguity rather than continuity <coughs> of some single Jewish literature is taken from Ruth Weiss's The Modern Jewish Canon. And this is the publication of Kafka's The Trial and the last Tavia story by Shalma Lechem, Lech Lecha. These were written against the background of the Baylis trial in Ke Kiev from 1911 and the eviction of Jews from villages. Miron's point, of course, is that Weiss is, it, that Weiss is wrong to seek only similarities between the two authors, Kafka and Shalom Lechem, and that she has misunderstood Shalom Lechem's story. Weiss, it will be re recalled, was responding to Howard Bloom's anxiety of influence, rejecting purely aesthetic criteria for the literary canon, preferring instead the definition of a Jewish literary text as one that was concerned with Jewish experience. Of course, this particular American post-war perspective is one in which both Hebrew and Yiddish were largely foreign to an <coughs> Uh, American Jewish readership whose Jewish cu uh, cultural knowledge barely uh, extended to Kafka in, in the best of cases. And we heard from uh, Hannah Wirth Nesha uh, uh, um, <coughs> of uh, Philip Roth's uh, description in Operation Shylock of the fictional Roth sitting in a classroom uh, unable to read the all important, a very significant uh, verse from the Bible written in Hebrew in cursive script on uh, the classroom board. Um, so perhaps that particular context, that particular standpoint, is not helpful uh, in the long-standing controversy over what Jewish literature is and if there is one. Um, that was a highly politicized struggle between assimilation and self-determination at the beginning of the 20th century a battle between Bundist and Zionist ideologies, and it was a debate dominated by didactic doctrines and ideological conformism that goes back to, uh, <coughs> um, to the period of the Haskalah. Um, and of course, it has been continued in Israel after the establishment of the state, all the way from Dov Sidan to Dan Miron, who I hope have something to say about that later today. My brief today, however, is not 
to quibble about the existence of Jewish literature or literatures, but to talk about cultural identity, without which there can be no sense in talking about Jewish writers or indeed Jewish readers. Saul Bellow, the American Jewish novelist, once asked who Isaac Barber was, a writer who knew enough Yiddish to write in Mamaloshan, but who wrote his extraordinary stories of the Red Cavalry and Jewish Odessa in the language of the Pogromshiki. We are all accidents, he asserted, born of a place and time, not of our choosing. Of course, cultural identity is something always in flux, and that changes with maturity, with circumstances. But nobody born, is born in a void, and one cannot ignore the unique context of Babel's birth and youth in Odessa, a major cultural center of Russian Jewry before World War I, where Bialik, Mendele, Shomrechem, Radnitsky, Klausner, Hadam, and many, many others were all uh, active. As for Jabotinsky, 14 years Barbel's uh, senior, Russian was Barbel's native language. <clears throat> Though in Odessa, with its cosmopolitan environment, as included rival ethnic minorities, as Jabotinsky noted, feelings of pride in Jewish identity were strong. Growing up in an assimilated Jewish family in Odessa, um, for Barber, Russian was not a choice, but a fact of life. And it did not mean one was any less immersed in Yiddish. By the end of the 19th century, no less than a third of Odessa's population was Jewish and Yiddish speaking. It is precisely context that is all important here not as a mere matter of biographical fact, <clears throat> but as an essential key to understanding referentiality in a literary text that relates to a polylingual cultural system and may be addressed to more than one readership. I argue in my book, Barber in Context, that contrary to some commonplace assumptions about the discrete integrity of national literatures, Babel was able, like many, many Jewish intellectuals in Russia at the time, to move freely between the Yiddish and Russian worlds. This was <clears throat> because he had been brought up to acculturate into Russian culture, which, as Yuri Shloskin uh, emphasizes in his book, The Jewish Century, was regarded by upwardly mobile Russian Jews as an entry ticket into social acceptability, despite the discriminatory practices of the Tsarist regime and the anti-Jewish violence of 1881 and 1904 to 1905. <coughs> we recall the boy in my first dovecote declaiming Pushkin in his delirium in order to gain the coveted place in the gymnasia. Russian literature was seen as a test of cultural literacy and social acceptance. So the reading of a Russian classic becomes a ritual of initiation, a sort of secular bar mitzvah, into cultural maturity. Later, in the ending of the sequel to my first dovecote, my, sorry, the story of my dovecote, my, um, which is called First Love, Barber's boy narrator will spew out some of the Jewish hysteria he has inherited from his forefathers after witnessing his father's humiliation in a pogrom. Anti-Semitism, he realizes, in an excised phase from that story, first love, is the cause of his, quote, early waning. And this is what always reminded him he was a Jew. Unlike Shalom Aleichem, who was <clears throat> to come back to Dan Miron's example, recovering from tuberculosis in foreign sanatoriums, uh, Isaac Babel was not only living in Kiev uh, from 1912, where the Bailey's trial took place, but published his first story known to us 
in Kiev in 1913 as a contribution to the debate on the Jewish question. That story, called Old Shloimi, Story Shloimi, <coughs> is written in a realistic fashion that we don't usually associate with Babel, um, eliciting pathos in the character of the old man who has been neglected by his children and now watches them in dumb passivity as they prepare to choose apostasy rather than share the fate of the Jews being expelled from the villages. Old Shlomi turns in his dumb anxiety, as in his dumb misery, sorry, to the, quote, greasy Torah of his forefathers and hangs himself, an act of despair that paradoxically affirms his Jewish identity, as uh, Roman Katzman has suggested. He rejects apostasy. The ending of Babel's story is very different from Shon Aleichem's Lech Lecha, which closes with Tevya wandering hopelessly from place to place after being expelled from his native Anatevka. The fact that Tevya's estranged daughter, Hala, has left her Russian husband and chosen to rejoin her family lends the tale an emotional poignancy that can only make the secular readers of the tale pity Tevya all the more for his good-hearted simplicity <coughs> and blind faith in the Kodosh Baruch Hu, especially in the wake of a new wave of deportations of Jews from the Eastern Front and destruction of Jewish communities in World War I after the story was written in 1914 and before it was published in 1916. His domestic misfortunes have prevented Tevya fulfilling the dream of settling in the land of Israel and has not followed his daughter to the poverty-stricken tenements of New York. Indeed, the biblical command of Lech Lecha, go thee from thy native van, father's house, etc., etc., does not lead anywhere. It is simply an order to get out. And Tevya can only console himself that in this final disaster, he is sharing the common fate of Russian Jews, secure in his knowledge that God will not forsake his people, even if the trials and tribulations they suffer seem endless. And Kafka, in the trial, um, which is of course not about the Bayliss trial, of course, um, which in fact uh, defies and resists interpretation, ends with uh, <coughs> uh, K uh, not being saved, not being redeemed. And in the parable before the Lord, you remember, um, he is told that there is indeed a door to salvation that was meant for him, and it is now closed. <coughs> um, in Barbara's story, the old man turns to the greasy soiled Torah of his fathers and commits suicide. The ambiguity, however, of the greasy soiled Torah mitigates any embracing of a Jewish world, whether we understand it to refer to a family er heirloom, an actual scroll, or in the larger sense of observance of Judaism, Torah. Either way, what counts is the cultural space in which this text is being produced, a liberal newspaper that regularly published articles on the Jewish question. The cultural space would have been shared by Russian and Jewish intellectuals, though presumably only the latter would have read Shomalechem stories in Yiddish. The Jewish educated middle class of Kiev included Boris Dovber Gronfein, a well to do business associate of Barbara's father, whose daughter, Zhenya, a budding painter, Barbara was to marry in 1919. Thank you. You can see some of the pictures. This was a readership that was a Russian that was Russian speaking and of and equally at home um, in uh, uh, Yiddish, the new modern Yiddish being uh, Yiddish fiction being written by David Belkerson and others. Um, and in many cases they would have been uh, <coughs> familiar with the new uh, modern Hebrew literature being published in Hatukufa in Moscow or in uh, translation in such anthologies as Safrut during the years of the Revolution and Civil War. The February Revolution, <coughs> which relieved Jews of legal restrictions, enabled them to freely 
um, enter Russian society and circulate in intellectual circus, circum, uh, cir uh, circles. It spurred the exciting period of Jewish Renaissance, which can be dated from around 1910, 1912 to uh, 1925, when the, in the second half of the 20s, uh, Stalinism curbed all experimentation and nationalist expressions of ethnicity um, uh, were uh, severely criticized and later condemned. Barber was well aware of the contribution that Odessa's cosmopolitan Jewish culture might make to Russian literature. In, 196, in a 1916 sketch in the Petrograd St. Petersburg Press called Odessa, he prophesied a literary messiah who would emerge from Odessa's sunny shores, Russia's own Maupassant. And if you're thinking of who that might be, um, and whether that might be a certain young man who was uh, very much uh, enamored with Maupassant's prose and <laughs> was a Jew from Odessa, um, I, <laughs> then that might be one guess. Um, uh, but then comes the revolution and the civil war and the destruction of Odessa's unique Jewish milieu and a dimming of that hope of a symbiosis between Russian, Yiddish, and um, Hebrew modernism. Um, and uh, that is, of course, as we know, a, a chapter of Hebrew literature, a chapter of Jewish culture that comes to an end as Bialik, <coughs> who very nearly uh, got himself arrested and executed during the Civil War, leaves Odessa in 1921. <coughs> Two, Babel in Yiddish, Yiddish in Babel. Of course, the often playful relationship of Hebrew and Yiddish in Russian Jewish literature and popular culture <coughs> was not unique to Odessa, but was quite commonplace not only in Mocha Mendel Sephorim, who switched from Hebrew to Yiddish and back again, but in numerous jokes that play on double meanings in Hebrew and Yiddish. Diglossia in Sholem Aleichem, lost in translation, creates humour out of Tevye's malapropisms and misquotations from the Bible and prayer book. For example, his literal understanding of biblical passages applied to his own life, or the use of phrases such as Ad Khan, the Shabbos of God, in Lefacha. Barber, by contrast, uses a form not of diglossia, but of literary bilingualism when he plays on the meaning of Yiddish idioms and stylized phrases in his Russian prose. Yiddish-speaking readers would be quite familiar with the folk tales about the 18th century trickster Herschel of Ostropol and would have enjoyed the playful translation, or <coughs> more accurately, calking into Russian of typically Yiddish expressions in Barbo's story, Shabbos Nachmo, published in 1918 an adaptation of Die Meister mit Shabbos Nachmo. An example of many, many, um, as many in the story, um, um, is when, well, the story about Herschel of Ostropol, which Barbara rewrote, adapted um, into Russian, um, is, of course, uh, the usual story of how Herschel is very, very hungry and poor and is thinking how to get his next meal, and he tricks a, a rather ignorant and <coughs> simple-minded innkeeper's wife into thinking that he is from the next world. Um, and he is none other than Shabbos Nachamu, um, who's come on an errand from her relatives uh, in the next world, and he persuades her to give him all the goodies she can give him, <coughs> and he runs off before her husband turns up to give him a good beating. Um, and the innkeeper's wife um, <coughs> uh, um, says... Uh, and maybe because of time I'll just read the English um, which, I mean the Russian is a kind of literal calc from Yiddish idiom by every wife is a husband a mensch but mine only knows to feed his wife with promises please God he should 
by the new year lose his tongue, his arms, and his legs. Now, I've inserted the word mensch there, but mush ka mush. Uh, there's no Yiddish here, right? It's, it's a Russian which any Jewish reader will recognize as having a Yiddish subtext. But of course, the Russian reader will, won't get it, right? He'll read the words literally, some kind of stylized Jew speak, perhaps. Um, and, and this is what happens uh, quite a lot in Barbara's own stories. Uh, a kind of what I've called a, a double bookkeeping, uh, a text in Russian that makes perfect sense, right, which can be read literally, but a subtext, as we'll see later, um, which only the Jewish reader can uh, interpret. In the Red Covery story, the Rebbe, the Rebbe, the Rebbe of Jutomir, identifies the alienated Jewish intellectual, Lutov, as a Jew. From where does a Jew come? A common address of one Jew to another in Yiddish. From venom come to Yid. Now, the Jewish reader recognizes that this is, in Yiddish, the typesetter of the first edition of uh, Konarmia. The recovery in 1926 didn't get it and put the comma in the wrong place. From where do you come? Jew. Uh, uh, but of course, <coughs> Uh, there were, uh, as many examples like this, um, um, uh, it's not just stylization of Jewish speech, but also a reference point. And here again, as I said before, we have to bear in mind the referentiality of the literary um, text. When Mutov identifies himself as a Jew from Odessa, he deserves the Rebbe's ironic reference to Odessa as the star of the exile a conventional term for a God-fearing city of devout sages, Ma'or Hargoyla. For it was infamous as a hotbed of secular enlightenment and vice. In a common Yiddish saying, Odessa was encircled ten miles around by the fire of hell. Sen mil from Odessa, brent der Gehinnem. Rather, the exchange between Lutov and the Rebbe contrasts two Jewish worlds. Odessa and Yutomir, a contrast <coughs> between cosmopolitanism, secularism, Haskalah, and a decaying world of traditional Judaism and Hasidism. It is a difference in 1920 <coughs> um, between, not just between the traditional state and the cosmopolitan port on the Black Sea, but more precisely between a decaying Odessa, where people can be said to be living, since they are not yet dead, and Jutomir, ravaged by war and pogroms, where it is simply horrifying. <clears throat> the old Jew whom he meets in Jutomir, Gadali, tells Lyotov <clears throat> that Hasidism is indestructible in the storm of history. But at the end of the story, Lutov turns his back on the destroyed shtetl and the dead world of the Rebbe and reports for duty on the Agitprop train, spreading revolutionary propaganda, whose bright lights and red star are the antithesis of the dying shtetl and the Jewish past. But of course, the Yiddish-speaking reader will have noticed the irony and will know with whom he is to identify. To refer is to engage dialogically with the surrounding ideological and historical discourse, as well as the linguistic deep structure of word, sound, and image. As Renata Lachman notes in her study of intertextuality in Russian modernism, quote, intertextuality demonstrates the process by which a culture continually rewrites and retranscribes itself. That is, a book culture renews its semiotic system and redefines itself through signs generated in texts that ensure the survival of cultural memory. To refer is to recover a cultural memory which has been destroyed by history and which is available to those readers with the linguistic tools and cultural knowledge to decipher the coded ethnic or ideological subtext. 
the resulting quotations inevitably conflict with other semantic um, associations in the text, creating humour out of semantic multiplicity and ambiguity. In Barber's red cavalry story, Gedali, interference of a Jewish language stylized Yiddish and reference to Jewish texts, Rambam, Rashi, introduces the referential frame of a condemned culture to which the alienated Jewish intellectual is nostalgically drawn. Interference has been described by the French <coughs> uh, literary critic Michel Serret as interreference, interreference, because the epistemology of knowledge resembles an, an, an encyclopedic web which resonates with local as well as global reference. Il faut lire interference comme interreference. Marie Baumgarten spoke of interreference in this sense in Gadali as a cultural cross-reference that negates the discourse of the revolution and points to moral irony. Luther looks around Jutomir on a Friday evening for the shy star, which tells him the Sabbath has set in and Jews will go to the synagogue to pray. This is a referential sign of a way of life <coughs> ruined by pogroms and war. Luther has turned his back on the Jewish past, but he cannot come to terms with the violence of the revolution, which is destroying that past, <coughs> nor can he overcome his own humanitarian Judaic values when faced by the violence of the revolution. Gedali is a story that engages Jewish readers with Yusuf's Jewish past by going back to Jutomir, Bialik's native town, and reminding us that we are, as in Bialik's poem, before the book cupboard, with Nearon Asfarim. However, the alienated Jewish intellectual who returns to the world of the Beta Midrash, the Beta Midrash, and Jewish traditions, the world of Yusuf's grandparents, is not the young man attracted a quarter of a century previously by the winds of the Haskalah and the new light of modernity in secular culture, but a Russian Jew who has joined the revolution which is dealing the death blow to the decaying shtetl, dispossessing the Jewish traders and bringing in its wake pogroms on a scale not previously seen in southern Russia and the Ukraine. Here, the Jewish bookshelf is a nostalgic memory that pulls Lutov towards his severed <coughs> roots in the Jewish past. And I'm going to read the English class if they don't have time to read the, the Russian as well. Uh, it is in search, uh, sorry, I, I'm going to read just a short passage from the beginning of Gedali. On Sabbath eves, the thick sadness of memories wears me down. Once, on these evenings, my grandfather's yellow beard stroked the volumes of Ibn Ezra. My old grandmother, in a lace head covering, weaved her, sm her crooked fingers over the Sabbath candles and cried sweet tears. My child's heart rocked on those evenings like a little ship on enchanted waves. It is in search of this Jewish memory and the Jewish bookshelf that Lutov engages an old shop, shopkeeper in Jutomir in conversation one Friday evening after, the red, after red troops have taken the town. Lutov brutally rebuts Gadali, who has studied Rashi and Maimonides, but there's no answer when the old man asks where is the justice and universal happiness promised by the revolution. Maimonides and Hebrew poetry are the reference points also in the last effects of Ilya Vatslavsky, the renegade son of the Jutomir Rebbe, who joined the communists in the vain hope of reconciling Lenin and Maimonides, party pamphlets and love. And in the book I have quite a uh, long uh, analysis of um, resonances to uh, Bialik uh, in uh, Red Cavalry, uh, which I'm sure any Jewish reader of that time would um, recognize uh, as Bialik was the national poet. Uh, I would like to say he still is, although uh, whenever I ask anyone uh, in Beersheba uh, <coughs> where, uh, what they know about Bialik, they always say, straight on, 
second on the left. Uh, um, well, Bialik, of course, was the national poet and the, the great um, author of Iwaharigara, Iwashita. Um, and most Russian Jews would have known him by heart, uh, if not in the original uh, Russian, uh, sort of Hebrew original, uh, uh, if not then in the Hebrew original, then in um, the Russian translations by Jabotinsky and uh, several leading Russian poets like Brusov and, and others. So th there is there uh, an entire world of referentiality for the Jewish reader. Um, let's perhaps, um, in the few minutes that are left, um, talk a little a bit more about the Jewish intellectuals bookshelf. There's the bookshelf of that Jewish intellectual who, <coughs> um, in his formative years, um, would have um, <coughs> uh, read Bialik or maybe even heard Bialik reading and has left the Jewish world, has not chosen Zionism, which was perhaps the major uh, pull for Russian Jews um, at the beginning of the 20th century, uh, has not chosen Bundism, but has seen in the international and universal uh, hopes for salvation uh, of, um, in, in, uh, the, in communism or one of the revolutionary uh, movements. Um, if Lutov identifies himself in Gedali, the Jewish bookshelf of his grandfather, with Ibn Ezra and Rashi, the bookshelf is no less determinant in cultural identity in Barbara's childhood stories, which are fictionalized portraits of a Jewish artist as a young man. Um, and this is a series of stories which Barbara <coughs> uh, had planned. We know even before the, the revolution, we have a, a first draft of a story about um, childhood at grandmother's in 1915. Um, and he, it was uh, to be a projected series called My First Dovecoat. And the first story, My First Dovecoat, <coughs> um, was published in 1925, um, dedicated to Gorky, and it was supposed to be uh, published together with its sequel, My First Love. Um, and what I'm going to suggest now, perhaps as a final example of the complexity of cultural identity in general, and Barber's cultural identity, is the way in which um, Russian literature and Russian literary texts become um, an integral part of the referentiality of um, the text. The boy um, in... Um, I'm going to skip this. Um, and, and here, I think, also, um, um, if we're talking about the first two of the series of childhood stories, um, <clears throat> um, 1925 is also the year when Mandel Stamm published his um, poetic memoir, um, Noise of Time, Shum Vremeni. And I don't think that's just a coincidence. I think it's a very uh, good opportunity to compare two very different texts which conceptualize cultural identity in very, very different ways. If we compare Osip Mandelstam's Noise of Time, published the same year as the two childhood stories, Story of My Dovecote and First Love, we can see that there could not be a greater contrast in cultural identity represented in the bookshelf that constitutes an archaeology of cultural identity. For Mandelstam, the Judaic chaos was a cacophony of non-glossia. Its language was not a language at all. And the bookshelf has its own geology, which embeds deep in the writer's consciousness the legacy of his father, an assimilated Germanized Jew who, escaped, who has escaped from the, quote, wilds of the Talmud to become an autodidact in Berlin, like so many masculine before him. A higher level is that of Mandelstam's mother, 
who, whose memories of growing up in Vilna in a Russianized environment of, idealized, of idealistic schoolgirls who idealized the Russian Jewish poet Natsen and supported Narodnia Vorya, a populist movement which attracted some Jews, including Ansky, who did not opt for Jewish nationalist or Zionist ideologies. The hierarchy of the bookcase is very clear. The German classics and Shakespeare in German translation, the father's heritage, stand lower than the shelves of Russian classics, the canonic Pushkin, Lermontov, the quasi-prohibited Dostoevsky and Turgenev, with his vanished tranquil life in Baden-Baden and the clarity of spring torrents. The Judaic chaos, as Magistan puts it, is thrown into the dust, together with the Russian history of the Jews, written in the Russian too correct to be natural. Indeed, Mandelstam associates the Judaic chaos with the mercantile smell of leathers, the bourgeois furniture, and the mechanical forced German correspondence of his father's alien world. When the Malamid is hired to teach the boy the rudiments of Hebrew, he is described as someone with an unnatural pride in his Jewish identity, which he hides when he goes out on the street. And the boy cannot find anything with which to identify in the Hebrew primer he is given to study. The maternal strata of the bookcase forms the poet's cultural identity in its canonization of Russian literature as the embodiment of civilization and social acceptance. The word intellectual is spoken by the mother with special respect. Whereas everything connected with the father's world is rejected as associated with the barbaric, non-culture, non-language of Judaism. Um, now, in Barbara's story, um, through stories, fictional stories, of course, <coughs> of um, a boy, um, about a boy who grows up in Nikolaev, um, uh, uh, during a pogrom, um, the story of my duck, as you probably know, um, is, is an introduction to what it means to grow up, to be a Jewish man, to have that violence literally smeared on your forehead when the boy's uh, coveted pigeons which he has received as a prize for getting into the gymnasia are smashed against his forehead. Um, and it's interesting, by the way, in that story, that the word pogrom, Pogrom comes right at the end of the story, when we no longer need that cliched, trite word, as Barbara once called it, to understand what it means to grow up Jewish in Russia. But in the sequel, A First Love, we have as intertextual <coughs> reference not a Jewish text, but the Russian one, Turgenev's novella of the same name, First Love, which Barbara had already uh, used as a text the boy reads to his grandmother in that early draft of 1915, Childhood at Grandmothers. What is interesting here is the boy's description of being sheltered by the Rupsov family um, during the pogrom. Uh, uh, and they have chalked a large cross outside the house so that they won't be touched. Um, and this Russian family, um, um, uh, which um, shelters uh, the Barber family, the fictional Barber family, um, includes not just a tax inspector who's been very kind to the Jews, um, but uh, Mr. Rupsov, who has come back from the Japanese war with a whole treasure of exotic items, and his no less exotic wife, uh, Galina Apolonova Rupsov. And this is the boy's first love. He falls in love with this eroticized, orientalized Russian woman. Um, and at 10 years old, he simply becomes infatuated with her. And you might ask, well, what is the connection with a Turgenev affair? Um, in fact, what happens is that the violence described in the excerpt from First Love in Barbara's earlier uh, unfinished story, um, <coughs> Uh, Charles at grandmother's, which he reads to his grandmother, who doesn't understand any Russian, um, 
is a scene of violence. It's a violence in which a boy sees his father strike the father's mistress with a whip. And the boy in that earlier uh, story, uh, <clears throat> Child at Grandmothers, acts out that uh, violence as a way of breaking out of this very stuffy, asphyxiating uh, Jewish home. It's as a way of externalizing the passivity of the Jews when faced by the very real violence outside on the street. And this is what happens in Barbara's later story of 1925. Um, I mean, later stories uh, like uh, um, uh, Awakening, uh, Barbara will have Turgenev and Juma on this music stand when he's supposed to be practicing the violin. And his father hopes that he'll become a famous um, violinist uh, like Oistrach or Hessen and play in Buckingham Palace. Um, the boy is, is interested in Russian literature and why? Why this fascination with Turgenev? And what is happening here in First Love? Where is this intertextuality working? And how is it working? And it seems to me that the sensuality, the sexuality, which the boy recognizes in scenes he's voyeuristically seen between husband and wife, between the Rupsovs, um, it is his way of not just escaping um, the Jewish world of violence and pogroms and persecution, but a way of empowering himself because he's looking through the window and he sees his father kneeling in the mud in front of a Cossack soldier and, and <coughs> implore, imploring him to save him, save the goods in his shop that have been thrown out, including, of course, the boy's own portrait, which was made when he got the place in the gymnasium. And the impassivity of the Cossack soldier, the way in which the, so the Cossack officer rides heroically <laughs> off into the sunset is very, very disturbing. Of course, the modernistic uh, image which distances the uh, narrator from what, in fact, is affecting the boy intimately. But the boy who is imagining that he, uh, like many other readers of Bialik's poetry, has joined the Jewish uh, Defence League and has got a, a useless rifle over his shoulder and is off with his friend Miron to fight the pogrom Gromis, <coughs> knows that he cannot fight his Jewish identity, which comes with violence, which comes with poverty. And so he actually uh, um, empowers himself. He tries to get that desire to acquire that desired masculinity by fixing his eyes on Rupsov, Rupsova, Mrs. Rupsov. Um, and I, perhaps I'll just read a little bit from what well, is not a very good translation, even if it's my own edition of Barbara's um, stories. Um, um, he actually starts vomiting, and he vomits into her face. And, it's a, it's a, and then we have a scene that is actually taken from um, uh, Chekhov's cherry orchard, where uh, something the, the Parkin remembers from his childhood is, is, is being reenacted. Um, and then in the silence I hiccuped. I stood by the wall with my cap pulled down over my eyes and could not stop hiccuping. For shame, my little uh, snub nose, Galina, smiled with a disdainful smile and flicked me with her red, a stiff uh, peignoir. She walked over to the window in her red shoes and began to hang Chinese curtains on the unusual window ledge. Her exposed arms drowned in the silk. The living tress of her hair moved on her hip and I looked at her with rapture. A bookish, nervous boy, I looked at her as if she were a remote stage lit by many lights. And at the same time, I imagined I was Miron, the son of the charcoal dealer who traded on our corner. I imagined myself in the Jewish Self-Defense League, 
and there I am, like Miron, walking in tattered shoes that are tied with string. On my shoulder, on a green cord, hangs a worthless rifle. I am kneeling by an old wooden fence, shooting back at the murderers. Behind my fence stretches a vacant lot, and in it there are piles of dusty charcoal. The useless <coughs> rifle shoots badly. The assassins in beards with white teeth are coming closer and closer to me. I experience a proud sense of uh, imminent death and, set, and see high up in the blueness of the world, Galena. I see an embrasure cut in the wall of a gigantic house that is built of myriads of bricks. This purple house defies the lane uh, in which the great <coughs> earth has been badly flattened. At its topmost, em at its topmost embrasure stands Galena, flushed with merciless winter gaiety, like a rich girl at a skating rink. With a disdainful smile, she is smiling from the inaccessible window. Her officer husband, half dressed, is standing behind her, kissing her on the neck. As I tried to stop hiccuping, I imagined all this so as to love Rupsora more bitterly, more ardently, more hopelessly, and perhaps because the bounds of sorrow are not great for one who is 10 years old, the foolish dreams help me to forget the doves and the death of Uncle Shoyle. I might even have forgotten about these murders had not Kuzma come on to the veranda at that moment with that terrible Jew, Rip Abba. And so on. Um, so the, there is a need not just to connect to a referential world of Turgenev, to transfer <coughs> that violence in um, Turgenev's story into a violence that can both uh, defy the pogroms, uh, fire back, but also to acquire the masculinity and prowess of a Russian uh, intellectual. I just conclude um, by leaving you a question. When we talk about cultural identity, what do we mean? And is cultural identity an accident of time and place, as Saul Bellow said? Or is there indeed, as Dan Maron insists, a contiguity between texts, but one that cannot, in any event, uh, ignore the context of this reproduction, the life and biography of the writer, and the cultural world uh, of the readers? Thank you very much.